is bioexam review part two. We're going to go through and we're going to go over DNA and some of the other stuff. So if we look, first of all, DNA pairing, remember you need to know that A and T go together and C and G go together. They're complementary, so they always go together. So 49 says fill out the DNA strand, the complementary sequence. See how A is the first nucleotide? T is going to go with A. I have G is the second one of my strand. I'm going to pair that with C. I have C. I'm going to pair that with G. I have C. I'm going to pair that one with G. I'm going to have A here. I'm going to pair that with T. And then I finally have G. I'm going to pair that with C. So that is how you make a complementary nucleotide sequence. Just remembering that A and T and C and G pair together. At least one question on that on the exam. Easy points. Describe the structure of DNA. The black pentagons are, for DNA, are sugars. They're actually deoxyribose sugar, ribose sugar, which basically forms the um, forms uh, the one of the parts that forms the backbone of DNA. What are nitrogenous bases? These are these right here: the A, T, the adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. Those are nitrogen bases. What weak bonds hold complementary bases together? DNA mo molecules held together with hydrogen bonds. So hydrogen bonds hold DNA molecules together because DNA molecules have to be able to be unzipped so they can be copied. The only way you can unzip them is if the bonds hold them together are very weak and easy to break apart. So that's a key thing you need to know. Uh, if the strand of DNA undergoes transcription, what will be the sequence of mRNA? Remember, N mRNA code is going to be uh, A and U go together and C and G go together. So if you take the code and you translate it, if we go back to our original code, which was A, G, C, C, A, G, A is going to pair with U in mRNA. That's one of the key differences in mRNA versus DNA. C, G is going to pair with C. C here is going to pair with G. So it's, let's put this here, U, C, G. Then I have A. I'm going to put another U there. And then I have G. I'm going to put a C there. And I'm missing one. Which one did I miss? U, C, G, G. That's what it is. So it's U, C, G, G, U, C. That is going to make up um, the mRNA code. Remember? A codon is a three-letter base sequence that specifies for a specific amino acid. So when we put together proteins, we use the chart here. First codon is going to use CG. So I go over here first. I have U. Then I find C. Then I find G. That's going to be serine. So it's going to be S-E-R is the abbreviation for it. The second amino acid is G-U-C. Well, G is here. U is here and C is there. So the second amino acid is going to be VAL. You would have to be able to identify using a little chart on the test. have to be able to do that. A codon is a three nucleotide code that specifies tide code that specifies a specific amino acid. Okay. Compare RNA and DNA in the following table. So we go to the following table. Key things you need to know. RNA Ribose sugar, that's where the R comes from. A and U are the bases, and C and G. So you have a U here, and in DNA, you have a T. That's one of the key differences. RNA strand is only a single strand. Where do you find in the cell? It's made in the nucleus, also exists in the cytoplasm. Plus, there's three kinds. The, the purpose of, or the function of RNA is to transfer code and to make proteins. DNA is deoxyribose sugar has A and T, C and G. Um, it is, combined, it is uh, made of two strands. It's a double helix structure. Kind of looks like, well, not with a highlighter. Kind of looks like a twisted ladder is what DNA looks like. DNA is only found in the nucleus of the cell. Um, simplified version of it. It's found in other places, but we're really just focusing on, on a simplified version. And it's also used to store code, store genetic code. So it can be transferred. It's instructions, basically, for building a cell. All right. What are the three types of RNA? There's mRNA, 
which transfers codes to the ribosomes to produce proteins. So that basically is like a messenger. It's called messenger RNA. The whole point is to relay a message. tRNA, transfer RNA, the, brings amino acids to the ribosomes to build the proteins. rRNA, the last kind, makes up part of the ribosome is actually constructed of RNA, rRNA. The weak bonds that hold DNA together, we already kind of answered this on a previous slide. Hydrogen bonds are like little magnets, kind of like refrigerator magnets. You can attach something to the refrigerator with a magnet, and then you can take it off when you want. A DNA molecule has to be able to be attached and detached. Why is it so important that the bonds are weak for our DNA? So they can be taken apart easily. I just talked about that. Process of protein synthesis. Remember, synthesis means to make. So we make proteins that make our body function properly. So that whole thing is um, protein synthesis. What you're doing is we're taking DNA code, we're changing it into RNA code, and then at the end of it, we're going to make proteins out of it. So it's a three-step process, central dogma of biology. We say that DNA codes for RNA, and RNA codes for proteins. That's really what we're talking about when we do that. What is translation? Translation is when we take RNA code into a protein. Transcription is just changing DNA code into RNA code. What happens to DNA when a mutation occurs? A mutation is a change in code. It's like your cell phone number. If you give your cell phone number to somebody, but you mess up one of the digits, it won't, it'll be a different sequence, and they'll call a different cell phone. So DNA code works the exact same way. So when you have a DNA code, it's a specific sequence, but mutations happen naturally. There are changes in code or changes in sequence. How would this affect the mRNA? It would change the codon, because remember we talked about DNA codes in three-letter sections. So a codon is three sections of mRNA. It could possibly change the codon. Going back to this chart here, you see this chart that we use? You could possibly, if you change the three-letter sequence, you could specify a different amino acid. If you have a different amino acid, um, you would end up with a different, possibly a different shape of a protein. So you would get 62. How can this affect translation? What you would end up with is you would end up with another amino acid. How does this affect the structure uh, shape of a protein? It could possibly change it. Um, sickle cell anemia is a genetic disorder that's caused by the chain, change of one single amino acid changes the shape of the red blood cells. All right, next one. Uh, complete the chart of mitosis and meiosis. Got to know these. There's a couple questions on the final. Pretty easy if you remember. Uh, mitosis is asexual reproduction. It's for reproduction for growth. And um, our, all of our cells undergo it, um, except our sex cells. Uh, diploid uh, is the number of uh, chromosomes, so double the number of chromosomes, basically pairs. Humans, we have 46 chromosomes, but we have 23 pairs. So chromosomes are like pairs. Uh, chromosomes are come in pairs. So when we say di means two, it means you have basically two of each. Um, at the end of it, you have a set of diploid um, daughter cells, so they're exact copies. That's the key thing about mitosis. Mitosis, when you go through it, mitosis produces exact copies of cells. Number of cell divisions it goes through is one. Number of daughter cells produced is two. Where does, uh, when does replication happen? It happens before, before uh, in the S phase of the cell cycle. Meiosis. Meiosis is for sexual reproduction. The chromosome number when you start is diploid, so you start with 46 chromosomes. But when you have children, you can't send all your chromosomes. You are a combination of your mother and your father's chromosomes. You got 26 chromosome, 23 chromosomes from your mom, 23 chromosomes from your dad. So in your sex cells in meiosis, you can only send half the number. So that's haploid means you're sending half the number of chromosomes. It go, undergoes two different cell divisions. And at the end, you actually produce four cells four cells. So to compare and contrast it, replication happens in the S phase before you un enter, enter a meiosis. All right, put um, these molecules, or actually no, these cells, put these cells in order. So put them in order. So the first phase, first thing that happens is always going to be 
prophase. Whoops, my marker's not working. So the first thing you have is prophase. Then the next thing that occurs is metaphase. After metaphase, you have anaphase. And telophase. And then you're basically back to interface, where a cell spends most of its life is going to be an interface. So you have to be able to identify these. Well, what happens in prophase is the chromosomes become visible and they condense down. So what's going to happen is that's going to be B. You can see the chromosomes are visible. The nuclear membrane is starting to break down, so that's going to be B. <coughs> metaphase. Metaphase is where they all line up in the middle. So metaphase, they're all going to line up in the middle and get ready to be pulled apart. So that's going to be E. If you notice, you have all the chromosomes. The nucleus is gone now. All the chromosomes line up in the middle. So step one, you can see the chromosomes in the nuclear membrane is starting to break down. That is B. This part, they all line up. All the chromosomes line up in the middle. The next phase is anaphase. Anaphase is when they start to split apart. So the chromosomes start to split apart. You see that in part A. Um, the next one is going to be telophase. Telophase is going to be D. So D, and that's where cytokinesis happens. That's where the cell is about to split into two. And then finally, returning back to interphase is going to be C. Uh, how many chromosomes do humans have in their body cells? We have 46 chromosomes in our body cells. All the cells in our body except our sex cells contain 46, a full set of chromosomes. In our sex cells or our gametes, we have 23. Definitely need to know that. Diploid means that you have two, two chromosomes for each set. So you have each chromosome you have is it comes in a pair. Haploid means that you have basically one for each. When does crossing over occur in meiosis? Crossing over is a natural um, scrambling of pieces of chromosomes from the mother chromosome, the chromosome you get from the mother and the father. That happens in prophase one of meiosis. That's one of the things that actually causes genetic variation is crossing over in prophase one. All right, what does it mean when you have a dominant trait? It means the trait is expressed. So like brown eye color or brown hair color is considered a dominant trait. So if you have the gene, a dominant gene for brown hair or brown eyes, you will have the trait. You'll have either brown hair or brown eyes. What happens, oh, how do we express it? We express it as a capital letter in genetics. What does it mean when a trait is recessive? It means you have to have both genes for it to be expressed. So the only way you can have express it, like blue eyes, you would have to have the gene for both of your genes would have to be the blue eye gene for you to have the trait of having blue eye color. Um, how do we show a recessive trait? We show it as a lowercase letter. So if you look over here in this pun and square, I have big T is dominant, little t is recessive, because we're talking about height, tall and short. So the dominant trait is big T, little t is short. So I go big T, little t here. I fill out my pun and square. It's just filling it in. should be pretty easy. Genotype of the parents, they're both going to be tall. Why? If you have a big T or the dominant trait, it's expressed. Each of the parents have a big T, so both of the parents would be tall. What are the genotypes and phenotypes of the offspring? Genotype is what your genes are. Those are the letters. So are you big T, big T? Big T, little t, little t, little t, that's genotype. Phenotype is what you look like, what your trait looks like. So the genotypes are going to be, for the offspring, I have one that's big T, big T. I have two that are big T, little t. And I have one that's little t, little t. So those are the genotypes. The phenotypes, this one's going to be tall. Why? Because it has a big capital, it has a dominant gene. This one has a big T, it's going to be tall. And finally, these, this plant is going to be short because it has two recessive genes, which require you're required to have two recessive genes in order to have the recessive trait. So the genotypical ratio of the offspring is 1, 2 to 1. The phenotypical ratio is I have one of these is tall, two of these are big T, little t, and then finally one of those is short. So overall, the trait for phenotype the actual trait of being tall. Three of them are tall, one of them is short. All right.
What does it mean if a trade is codominant? You can actually skip this. We're not going to put that on the exam. So we're going to skip that. Um, we're going to skip 73 too. We took that off the exam. Skip that actually too. So all those from the study guide you can skip. We took those questions off the exam. Uh, what are sex chromosomes? If you are a male, it means your chromosomes, your XY. If you are a female, your XX. Colorblindness and hemophilia are sex-linked traits. What does that mean, a sex-linked trait? It means that you are on the 23rd pair of chromosomes, also called the sex chromosomes, because the 23rd pair of chromosomes, if you have XX, you're a female. If you have XY, you're a male. So that determines your sex. Some traits are sex-linked, meaning they occur on the 23rd chromosome. Um, populations of organisms have very uh, many genetic variations. Where do these come from? Mutations are random changes in genetic code. They happen naturally. Everything undergoes natural mutations. So that's why there's differences in variation within a species because there's natural changes in DNA code that just happen. It just gets miscopied um, during uh, meiosis. Um, organisms that could reproduce exp exponentially, but they don't. Why not? What are they restricted by? The reason why everything doesn't reproduce ex exponentially, meaning that they don't keep making more and more and more, is there's limited resources. There's not enough resources for all the animals or plants to survive. So what happens is there's competition. When there's competition, some survive, some don't. Uh, genetic variations lead to adaptations. What is an adaptation? Adaptations are characteristics that help species survive. So an adaptation is something that helps a species survive. So if you have a good adaptation, it means that you will survive better. Let's say you're a fast cheetah. means that you can kill more things, you eat, long, eat more stuff, means you survive longer and you reproduce. That's a good adaptation. A tall giraffe, which is able to gut up in the trees and get nutrients and stuff like that, would be a good adaptation. Some adaptations have better survival value in certain environments. What does that mean? Some traits are better than others. So some traits are better than others. That's what that means. So some traits are better than others. Which means that um, those species that have those traits will survive longer. What does it mean to be fit for the environment? It means you have better adaptations. That's what it means. So it means whatever your adaptations are help you survive longer. So that means you either are a better hunter, you can collect more sunlight if you're a plant. So anything that says you're better fit for the environment means that you are better adapted. Uh, the next population will have a high frequency of genes that have been selected for. Why will the frequency of the selected genes increase? The animals that have or plants that have better adaptations, they end up surviving. When they survive, when they survive, they end up reproducing. So when they sur I this thing's all messed up. When they survive, what happens is they survive, they live longer, which means they end up reproducing. When they reproduce, the whole point of them reproducing means that they pass on their genes. Those genes contain the traits that are a better fit for the environment. That's the process of evolution. So the first thing is you have to survive. When you survive longer, you reproduce more. When you re reproduce more, you pass on more of the genes. So what happens is over time, species inherit more of those traits. Darwin's theory of natural selection means that species that have better adaptations will survive and reproduce over time. It's almost the same thing we just said, and their ad adaptations will be become more common. When this process continues over millions of years, it leads to speciation. That's the idea of creation of new species from common ancestors. If you take, remember, Darwin and his finches. Let's say this is a finch. Not the greatest drawing of a finch, but whatever. You have a couple islands. You start out with a common ancestor. One finch goes here, another finch of the same species goes here. Over a couple of millions of years, they adapt to the different islands. You end up with two different finches. I really should go back to art school. So there's one finch right there. Then you have another finch that looks a little different, maybe one that's slightly different. Wow, these are awful. 
but you get the idea. That's what speciation is. Speciation is you have common ancestors for whatever reason. They get geographically separated, reproductively separated. Over time, they form into different species. So that's what speciation is. Uh, three domains proposed above the kingdom level. You have eubacteria, which is modern bacteria. Archaebacteria, which is... Um, which is ancient bacteria which only survives in harsh environments. And then you have eukaryotic bacteria that got cut off for some reason. Eukaryotic, uh, eukaryotic organisms which are multicellular or tend to be multicellular and more complex. Those are the three domains. Current level of classification system. Remember, uh, did King Philip come over for good spaghetti is a good way to memorize that. Domain is the largest one. We have three domains. We have six kingdoms. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. An easy way to remember that is did King Philip come over for good spaghetti? So it's, you had, that'll be on the exam. You'll have to know a couple of them or what order they're in. We use binomial nomenclature in biology. is a system that we use to name all living things. So binomial nomenclature is a system that we have to name all living things. How do you write a scientific name? Genus is first. It's capitalized. Species is second. It's lowercase. So when you go to write a scientific name, it's genus and species. All right. What is a cladogram? Cladogram is a branch showing um, derived characteristics. Those are ways you can separate out and see common ancestry. So if you look here, you have the greatest difference in ancestry is the greatest distance in a, on the clade. So DNA, biochemical analysis, embryology, and morpho morphology are used to classify organisms. They try and determine common ancestors. So when we look at evolution and we're trying to see who's related, we look at who's similar structure and fossils, who has the same kind of DNA, proteins, um, to classify organisms to have, so that they have common ancestors. We can trace it back. Who's related to who? So if we look here, which one, they say, according to the tree, which ones are the most closely related? The ones that are the most closely related occur on the same little branch here. So you have crocodiles and birds, lizards and snakes, and also frogs and salamanders. Because they're one little branch apart, which means, um, which means that they're not, um, not too far off from each other. They're still closely related. Which uh, organism is most, uh, most closely related to the ray fin fish? So if you look at a clade, you find the ray fin fish here. Find whatever's closest to it will be its closest common ancestor. And that, if you can read it, it's very small on here, is the lungfish. But that's how you read the clade. Which organisms are mammals most closely related to according to what this chart, the species listed on this chart? Mammals are right here, so I would look right next door. Right next door to that, you see birds, and that's how you read a clade. All it is is a visual breakdown. The closer they are, the closer they're related. The farther apart they are, the less related they are. If they're on the same branch like you see here, it means they're very closely related. All right, fill in the following chart with characteristics from the various kingdoms. Um, first thing is, are they prokaryote or eukaryote? Prokaryote means they're single-celled. So archaea is prokaryote. Eubacteria, modern bacteria, is prokaryote. And then the rest of them are considered eukaryotes. And remember, eukaryotes mean that they're more complex. They have a membrane-bound nucleus, so they have a nucleus and membrane-bound organelles. Are they multicellular or single-celled? Well, archaea or ancient bacteria are going to be single-celled. So are eubacteria, like E. coli, are single-celled. The rest of these, this is going to be both. Fungi can be both. And then plants and animals are all multi and multi. Next one, do they reproduce sexually or asexually? Um, bacteria is going to be asexual. This is going to be asexual. These are going to be both, 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 and both. Uh, autotrophic or heterotrophic? Autotrophic means do you make your own food? In this case, um, bacteria is going to be both, both, both. Uh, fungi is just going to be heterotrophic, which means it gets its nutrients from the environment. Plants we know are autotrophic. Plants make their own food. 
and animals we know are heterotrophic. Uh, aerobic or anaerobic respiration, this is going to be anaerobic. You bacteria can be uh, aerobic, 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 aerobic. Last but not least, cell walls. Yes, yes. This is maybe, it depends. You don't really need to know this line too much. Uh, fungi have cell walls. Plants have cell walls. And animals do not have cell walls.